Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity this week to pause in our study of the history of Israel and to really think about prophecy and what it means, what it means that you speak, that you intervene in history, that you pursue us, that you desire your people to know you and trust you and follow you and live rightly before you. So Lord, would you please be with us as we listen? We ask that your spirit would be among us and um, filling us. Father, we cannot hear rightly without the work of your spirit. And so we ask that our hearts would be soft and our ears would be open and our eyes would be able to see that which you have for us. Uh, Father, I pray that you would be with me and guide and guard my words, that I might say only what glorifies Jesus and uh, would lift him up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm guessing that you have been there. You've been talking with someone and you see something that they don't know, that they don't see. They've got something huge and black stuck in their teeth. They have something icky on the back of their pants that they sat in, uh, their flies down. And so if you've been in that space, uh, at least I have definitely been in that space, um, I have this wrestle, this agony inside me. Do I say something? What does that look like? Um, why would I say it? Why not? Um, of course, I think, well, you know, I would want to know. But, uh, you know, for some reason, that's just really hard to say. Um, then the stakes get higher when the problem that you can see and that they don't becomes more critical. And this actually happened to, um, to us over Thanksgiving break where um, there were signs that a family member that um, I was with, there were some signs that, you know, other members of the family just were casually talking about that they saw, um, you know, grandma had this and this, such a had happened and, um, and I was like, because I know that had happened to my mom, I was like, oh my gosh, yikes, this is really important. She needs to go to the doctor immediately and get that checked out. Um, but uh, what happens, you might think about when maybe you have a coworker and you see a pattern of um, bruising, of lame excuses, accidents. Um, maybe you have a friend who is making some very dangerous life choices and, um, and walking down a path that you know will ultimately harm them. Um, so going beyond the matter of like temporary embarrassment, you know, somebody has something stuck in their teeth a day and that's probably not a big deal, but to matters of well-being and life and death. And um, it seems like to me, and uh, maybe you agree, the greater the problem the more urgent it is to not ignore it, to let that person know, um, to help, to have them get help. Um, some news is hard to say. Uh, some news is really hard to hear. But sometimes the most loving path is to say that thing. Um, and it's wise when, uh, I don't know if you've been on the receiving end of, of that. I have. Um, I had a friend a couple of years ago um, who confronted me about some patterns of like kind of critical bitterness, some nasty words that I was, you know, I was talking about such, you know, these people, you know, this group of people and she was, you know, she intervened and said, you know, over coffee and said, you know, Vicki, this is not good. You need to not be doing this. Um, and so I'm wondering when have you been on the receiving end, but of loving, but hard news and how did you respond to that? Um, the bigger picture of this as we are transitioning kind of, hopefully you can see where this analogy is going uh, as we take this week to think more deeply about prophecy and what it is. Um, God sees rightly. He sees everything that there is to be seen and he knows the desperate plight that we are in collectively as humanity, but also individually as people. Um, and if I mentioned this, uh, like at the start of the year, I think 
we talked about a C.S. Lewis quote, um, the idea that God has made us like a human, a person is makes a machine and he made us uh, to run on himself, just like a car is meant to run on gasoline and it doesn't run properly on anything else that we as humans were made in God Im- God's image. God designed the human machine to run on himself. And so God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself it doesn't exist. It is not there. And the tragedy of human history since Genesis 3, if you know that story, um, that we have a long and terrible story of trying to find other things, things other than God to run on, things other than God to make us happy, to have peace. And the reality is we can't, you and I can't. Um, we can't collectively. And so the reality of the Bible and prophecy is a microcosm of this is that God loves us enough to pursue us. He sees the dangers that we cannot see. And uh, we should listen to what he says, even though the news is often really hard to hear. And so uh, that's our aim, hopefully tonight um, in our little talk, uh, this little talk, Hopefully it will be little. I'm praying that it will be. Um, God made us to flourish only in him and with him. And he loves us enough to pursue us, to call us back to him. Um, So this week, again, we're preparing for a shift in our study. We've been mostly in Old Testament narrative, uh, first and second Kings and second Chronicles to this point. And we're taking this week to kind of catch our breath because now we're going to be turning, now that we've studied that context, we're going to be turning to study the literary prophets that have been recorded for us, many of them, including uh, before our Christmas break, we're going to study Jonah next week, and then we'll study Amos the week that we that we'll discuss on that December 19th. And so just pausing to get our heads around this key concept, understanding what it means that it is that God speaks and that his words matter. And that when he saw his people, Israel and Judah, as we've been studying that context up to this point in our study, when he saw them walking on a dangerous path, they were not, they were trying to run on things other than him. They wanted to put not God in their oil tank or their gas tank, but other things, um, including false idolatry, uh, idolatrous worship. Um, and so he, God, in that situation, he pressed in and he said hard things. He appointed prophets to speak hard but corrective words that those specific people needed to hear. And um, we're thinking about what does it look like for us to read those things that God said to that specific group of people in history. Um, we've definitely seen multiple, point, multiple prophets so far in Kings, notably Elijah and Elisha. So um, we know a little bit like what prophets do, but we've seen the hearts of God's people, both the Southern kingdom and the Northern kingdom drift further away from God. And we'll see at this point, God doesn't withdraw from his covenant commitment to them. He presses in. And one of the ways that he presses in is to send prophets with beautiful and mysterious messages. And we're going to be studying a lot of those the rest of the year. Um, And these messages are preserved for us in scripture. So our outline tonight, we're going to be thinking about the big picture. That's sort of what we're thinking about right now. And then we're going to take a time to look at a prophecy, Isaiah 1, 1 to 2, 5, kind of as a microcosm of what prophecy is is in scripture and how does it work? And so that's sort of the idea that our lesson tonight um, doesn't uh, have, like I heard that, you know, someone is like, hey, what are we reading tonight? Well, it's about 30 disparate scriptures all over the the, the Old and New Testament. So um, yeah, you guys are gonna have fun. I know you'll get to read some of those um, and, and, and definitely, and talk about them in your groups. 
I thought it would be helpful to maybe have one passage that we can see many of the points that BSF is trying to help us learn about prophecy. We can see them illustrated in this one prophecy, you know, this one section. It's part of the introduction of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is very long. It's 66 chapters. So this is actually the very first part of the introduction. The introduction is almost five chapters. Um, And so uh, that's what we're going to do tonight. So we're going to do that until Brett gives me the signal that my time is up. So (laughs) we'll just see how far we go. Um, Okay, so um, big picture, uh, prophecy is not fundamentally about dates and facts and natural disasters. Prophecy is about the trustworthy, covenant-making, covenant-keeping God calling people back to himself. And I think... I suggest to you that a core of prophecy is summarized in Isaiah 45, 22. I should put that up there. Uh, where he says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. So the core prophetic emotion, even though these books, as we read them, they're gonna be kind of hard to read, uh, hard to hear. There's a lot of hard things in them, and we'll see some of those uh, as we're looking at this passage tonight. Um, But I suggest to you that if we remember this context, God's covenant-keeping character, the core prophetic emotion is love, not hate. He's pursuing his people because he loves them. If you have a friend who's walking a dangerous path and you pursue them, like my friend Julie did with me, it's because she loved me. It wasn't because she wanted to rub my face in it that I was um, walking some hard way, but it's because she loved me. So the, um, and we see this in Second Chronicles thirty six fifteen. If you're looking for like, oh, okay, Vicky, well, where do you see this in the narrative? Second um, Chronicles thirty six fifteen, God's compassionate concern for His people and His world. Uh, it reads the Lord, and this is talking about the southern kingdom, Judah, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. And prophecy comes then implicitly, almost always, with an invitation to repent. And there's always, even though prophecy will talk about judgment, and sometimes very severe and scary judgment, there's a gap almost, almost always between the pronunciation of that judgment, the declaration of it, and the execution of it. And that gap is there so that God's people will turn. They'll repent and say, maybe he'll relent if we would turn back to him, if we would turn back to him. Um, because God, God loves us. Um, he, even though he's infinite, he's a God who loves us and he's made us in us him he made us in his image. He condescends to speak to us using language we can understand to lisp to us. And he's spoken his words through his prophets so that you and I could know his character so that you and I, and we together can trust him with what he's doing in the world and in our individual lives. And so that's why we're studying these books. It's not just about learning facts, um, It's about meeting the living God in his word and being transformed. And because only he, we only run on him. And that's the only way we can flourish. We need him for wholeness and health and happiness and life and everything and joy and purpose. Um, Most of us don't have tons of practice reading prophetic poetry and it can be challenging. Um, It requires, I I suggest to you, more interpretive effort, not less. So even though we are going to be going really fast through these prophetic books, I suggest to you that don't get to the end and say, I've studied Amos. (laughs) I've begun to study Amos. (laughs) The the poetry invites us in. So that's what we're going to do right now. Um, Jump right in. Um, So let's just look at example. Um, Isaiah 1, 1, um, 2 to 4. Five. And so um, open your Bibles up to Isaiah or turn them on. Isaiah is the book right after Psalms. So if you open up a Bible like right in the middle, it usually will be Psalms. And then Isaiah is the next, very next book. Um, 
And so we're going to look and see our, our lens here is not to look at all the things that Isaiah is saying, but rather seeing this as an example of prophecy. How does prophecy work? How do we read it? What does it say about the Lord? And so we'll look at it in three divisions, if you can call it that. Um, we'll see, just look at the one, one where God intervenes in history. We'll see prophecy always has a context, historical context. And then we'll look at one, two to verse 20. We'll see that prophecy's message exposes danger and invites repentance. God exposes danger and invites repentance. That's the message. And then C, uh, our last division, 121 to 25, God engaged hearts and minds with prophecy. Prophecies, oh, it should say method. There you go. Prophecies methods. Hopefully we'll get there. That's, that's the division I'm super excited about getting to, but we'll see how our timing goes. Okay, so um, yeah, let's read our first uh, verse, 1-1, one, one, opening up with Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amaz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so really this verse reminds us that prophecy just didn't float down from anywhere. It's grounded in history. God intervened in history and spoke through a certain person who was appointed and set apart for this purpose. And he spoke to people. And so we'll talk about the, um, the what, the who, and the when. And that to be cooperative readers of prophecy, we really have to keep those things in mind. And it's hard to do, especially in a book like Isaiah and Jeremiah, those books just go on and on. Um, in, or it can feel like that to us. So we have to keep those in our mind. Who's the original audience? Why is the Lord speaking to them this way? We can see here the what, um, in this case specifically is a vision, a Notice that it's vision singular Isaiah has from God. Um, the idea behind a vision is twofold. I suggest to you that um, it suggests that God is sharing his perspective on reality, what he sees, um, the way th- things truly are. But also the original readers likely understood that this is one of the ways that God sent a prophetic message. Um, like Hebrews 1 and 1 and 2 talks about God used prophets in a variety of ways and means um, before our Lord Jesus came to reveal God fully to us. What were some of those ways? Visions, dreams, or straightforwardly face-to-face. And so um, one of the first verses, the first verse I have up there for us, Numbers 12, 6 through 8, we have the Lord defending Moses, his servant, to Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam. And he said, quote, Now I hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. It is not this way for my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, that is, openly, and not using mysterious language. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Again, he's not saying... Why were you not afraid, not us, but Aaron and Miriam? Um, Okay, so a vision and dream, according to that, is the Lord making himself known in mysterious language. And he's doing that to one person so that they would be his spokesperson to God's people. And so that's a point throughout for all prophecy, regardless of what means or method that it is, um, it should be unoriginal. It should convey exactly what the Lord appointed that prophet or prophetess to speak. And the key exemplar we have that um, in scripture was Moses, that the Lord chose to mediate his words to the people of Israel and Pharaoh, um, Exodus 3 and forward. We've seen that in 1 Kings um, 22 verse 14 with Micaiah, who says to King Ahab, I believe, as surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him, the king, what the Lord tells me. So prophets' messages were not their own. They were the Lord's. And they, they would be accountable to the Lord um, 
for their being accurate. And so uh, Deuteronomy 18, um, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, and Deuteronomy 18, 14 to 20, uh, probably don't have time to read those right now, but uh, those are two ways that the Lord helped people know what to do with prophets and prophets' messages. Um, p- two things, people had to be discerning about which messages were from God and which were not, which were false and what that meant. And then the second, for authentic prophecy from the Lord, the people must hear and respond. The prophet is coming with God's message. And so their response to the prophet is basically their response to God. And God takes that seriously. And so prophets, as they, uh, as they would speak, they needed to be validated as true prophets. Um, and I suggest to you, one of the passages that we read, Isaiah 6, 1 to 10, the call of Isaiah, um, and I hope you guys will have fun discussing that tonight, that is a vision that in part validates Isaiah as a true prophet. And so one of the applications for you and for me, for the original audience, but also for you and for me, is that Isaiah didn't make all this stuff up, but this is true message from God. And you and I, and I mean the original audience, but also you and I need to take it seriously. Our call is to hear and not hear like we're just, you know, like we're scrolling and scrolling and we read and then we move on, but really hear. And let those words get inside us and rattle around and be that we would be transformed by the Lord and by his spirit and by his word, a logo, logos centric sort of uh, life and identity. Um, so that's the what, the what, um, okay. So we see, I'm sorry, there's <laughs> a lot in this little verse, um, uh, the who, we see Isaiah specifically named and he's the son of Amaz. That's a very Old Testament kind of way to validate this is a real person. This isn't just somebody who's been made up, but he's actually a son of this specific um, person, Amaz. Uh, Isaiah is also anchored in our biblical narrative, 2 Kings 19 and 20. And then it's uh, implied, of course, in the who, not stated explicitly, but like we were saying that, that our God is the origin of this and Isaiah is the, is the messenger. He is the Holy One. And so um, if you look at verse four, the end of verse four, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. The Lord is holy. And look at verse six, or sorry, chapter six, uh, verses one to four. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that would be Isaiah, saw the Lord. So again, he receives visions sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings with two, he covered his face and with two, he covered his feet and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me for I am lost for I am a man with unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Okay, so that's an important context to to see why is there a need for a prophet anyway? Because the Lord is holy. And we as humans, sinful, rebellious, are unholy. And it is dangerous for us to enter the presence of a holy God. And so we need a mediator. We need a prophet to intercede for us. Um, The primary audience probably, uh, we can say here in verse one, that um, was, even though it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem, is probably to them. Um, And look at that long span of probably about uh, 50 or 60 years of a ministry that he had during during those reigns in the kingdom of Judah. And so likely um, that's, that's the, again, the specific time and place. Um, When we read prophetic books, particularly, we are reading someone else's mail. We're invited to do it but it's not written to us. 
And that's really, I mean, really careful to remember because there's a lot of yous that go throughout the prophetic books. It's very rarely that the you that's written in the prophetic book is actually you or me, right? And so to remember, sometimes it reveals principles about the Lord and how he deals with people generally and his people. And so we can include ourselves in that. Um, but it's, it's definitely, we have to remember we're reading someone else's mail. And that is the mystery of the Bible, this collection of ancient documents written by human authors in real time, real place for real people, for real specific purposes. And yet in such a way that God breathed these words by his spirit. Second Timothy three fifteen to 16 talks about that. And so that these words, even though they are historically grounded, they also can be fully said to be God's words. And as such, they fully reflect God's character. And so um, God has preserved these words to us. And so when we're reading, uh, we need to keep these questions in mind. Here are four questions. One, what was the original context and the main audience? And how were they invited to respond? Two, what does the text reveal about God in his unchanging ways? Three, how am I or how are we like and unlike the original audience or the characters in the text? And as such, how can we respond? How ought we be shaped by this at our point in redemptive history? And then four, how does this text point us to Jesus? Because ultimately it does. It does point us to our Lord Jesus. Um, Luke 24 44 is a a great place to read um, about that. So just some takeaways, I think, for this first division. um, I've done a lot of talking in a little tiny verse, but um, God speaks things real people need to hear. Why? Because he loves us. And so what's the main application, the main response for you and for me? We should listen. We should be wise and careful listeners. And I wonder, what kind of listener are you? How do you respond? How do you hear God's words? How has he shaped you already? And if you are a Christian, um, you know, there are probably ways. I am not a perfectly good listener for sure, right? And you probably aren't either. Um, But there are some ways, if you've already put your faith in Christ, you have listened. The verse that is in your lesson from John 10 talks about he's the the good shepherd and his sheep know his voice. And so if you are in Christ, you know his voice. You are listening and he's training you how to listen to his voice through the Holy Spirit. Um, And so second takeaway, God speaks through human messengers. He's holy and we cannot approach him directly. And that's why um, we, we, need, we need a mediator. That's why it's such a big deal that he sent Jesus, who is fully divine and fully human. He revealed Jesus, he revealed God to us fully, Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. And what is our response to that? We should honor the Lord as holy. And we should also respond with hearts of praise and compassion and thankfulness that he would send his Lord Um, that he would send his son, the Lord Jesus, to do that for us perfectly. Okay, let's move on very quickly. I'm looking at my time, so we're gonna speed through this. Um, God, we'll see how far we get. Um, Second division here we see in verses two to 20, um, God exposes danger and invites repentance. So I'm just gonna read this all as one chunk. How about that? And I want you to listen Listen for the danger that's being exposed and listen for the ways that God invites repentance. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation of people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up, or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. 
In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. What land again are we thinking about? Judah, the southern kingdom, right? It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should not have been like Sodom. We should have been like Sodom, yikes, and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, said the Lord. I've had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you? This trampling of my courts. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds, but from from before my eyes cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Okay, so in that, God, did you hear that? Exposing danger. God is bringing, this is the true perspective. This is the reality of who you are. They probably, like the people thought they were doing fine. Probably. They were, you know, it seems like using contemporary language, they were in church every time the doors were open, right? They were doing all the, you know, they could have seen like, oh, we're doing all the right things. And yet they had totally missed the character of God. They totally misunderstood his desire that what he wanted was not a church full of people doing outward things, but whole people who would be worshiping him the way he had intended them, but also living out and displaying his glory as they went to the market, as they would drive their, their carts, as they're passing by the widow, the neighbor that they have. So you can see that, um, hopefully you can hear that, um, hear that, uh, um, God is exposing danger and, um, inviting repentance. And something I, before we move on from this in the next section, just wanted to push into the idea that, um, look at the metaphors, um, that the Lord is using for himself in verses two and three and four. Um, he is a father. Children I have reared and brought up. Um, he is like a animal husband. I couldn't think of it. It's not really a farmer. I don't know. Somebody who owns animals and takes good care of them. Um, he's like that. Um, and he's like a king. Look at that verse, uh, the Holy One of Israel. Um, that's kingly language or judgment or like he's a judge. And so these different, um, these are not transactional spaces. The audience and God already have a relationship grounded in his graciousness, in his covenant. Um, children I have I reared and brought up. He brought them out of Egypt. He brought them to himself. He showed, he gave them everything that they needed. He brought them into a good land. He planted them in these spaces that gave them homes they had not built, cisterns of water. They didn't dig those out. Vineyards they got to eat from that they didn't plant. There were just all these good things. Um, And so 
the prophecy here is the natural outflowing of an existing covenant relationship. We need to hear that. This is not about just, oh, you're doing that bad and you're doing that bad and you're doing that bad. There is a forsaking of a covenant relationship that the people of Israel had agreed to. They had said, we will do everything the Lord commands. And they entered in that agreement. Um, And you can see or hear, I hope you can hear verse four um, and like the very intimate language, the questions. Um, This is not, the Lord is disciplining his people. He has hard words to say, but it doesn't, he's not delighting in that. He wants them to turn and repent. Um, And specifically like verses 18, um, I mean, that points us ahead to our Lord Jesus, right? Um, Even though the sacrificial system uh, was a way for uh, Israel to deal with unholiness and that they could have their holy God dwell among them, um, symbolically in the temple in Jerusalem, we know that that was incomplete. And Hebrews 9 and 10 talks about that. The blood of goats and bulls does not take away sin. And so this could only point forward and be fulfilled fully in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Okay, moving on. Last section here. There's so much more we could talk about, right? Um, But uh, restored relationship with God begins with a repentant heart. Oh yeah, I meant to say that. (laughs) Like we have to start there. The restored relationship with God begins with a repentant heart. Um, Sort of like when you're um, painting a room, if you're gonna paint a room, um, when I started to, like the very first room I thought I was going to paint, I was like, oh, I can get this done in the afternoon. No, like all the work is in the prep, right? You have to spackle and gouge out the cracks and it looks terrible and it takes forever. And yet it's really important if you don't do that step, you're just glossing over things that are ugly and hard and need to be fixed. Um, Okay, so um, how do you respond when uh, the Lord exposes danger in your life? Um, how has he helped you by his spirit to hear that and turn away from it and to give you a heart of repentance? And um, where have, uh, yeah, how have you, have you seen um, him help you agree, agree with him? Uh, I'm sorry, him help you agree with him about your sin? How is it grieved? Does it grieve you? Um, does it grieve me? God lovingly pursues us with the full news, the good and the bad that we desperately need to hear and we should repent and be healed. Okay, last division here. Um, just quickly, uh, 121 to five. Uh, do we have time enough to read it? Probably not. Um, <clears throat> oh my gosh. Okay, um, thinking here about methods. Um, our culture teaches readers and listeners to be efficient, that we should value that. Um, We should devalue repetition. We want things that are short, Um, a fun video on TikTok, a meme. We want study Bibles with just like clear summaries. Um, And uh, many of us like reading Paul. He's logical, he's linear. When if you're looking for a, a blog post on a recipe, who doesn't just scroll to the bottom, get to the recipe? Seriously, I don't want to know all the ways that you did the things with the eggs and whatever. Just, I want to know the recipe. And so um, if you and I were going to confront a friend with hard words, how, of a, how many of us would start with a parable like Nathan did with David in Second Samuel 11 or Second Samuel 12? Um, how many of us would use poetic imagery like Micaiah did in First Kings. Um, this is one of our greatest challenges is that you and I have been graded um, literally by teachers who've marked us down for redundancy in our essays. And some of us are teachers who have marked people down <laughs> for redundancy in essays. Um, okay, so I, uh, we think of repetition as a drawback. We think of poetry as inefficient. Poetry is fine and good, like it's fun for a song or whatever, but we wouldn't actually need to use it if it were really important. Um, I suggest to you the biblical authors did not share these priorities. 
Their arguments are not linear, they're cyclical. Cyclical. The pronouns and the shedding settings shift rapidly. There are very few transition sentence, sentences and they're far between, um, few and far between. Because um, the problem that prophecy addresses, I suggest to you, is not merely or primarily a lack of information. It is a heart problem. Sometimes it's a lack of information, right? Because we don't know. We're finite. Um, or we forget and we need to be reminded. But fundamentally, our core problem is a heart problem. We don't really like the Lord being in charge of our life. To have the, me think, just frankly, for me to think about the Lord is the source of everything good and happy in my life. Like I need to like go to him and, and always go to him. Like there's a part of me that re- just really bristles under that. Um, and that is a, a heart problem. And so I suggest to you that um, poetic prophecy addresses the heart problem. Um, it invites us in. So there's metaphors that are different. So it might, f- I suggest to you, the repetition is there for a, for a reason. Climb up inside that imagery and look around and try to figure out, ask questions. Um, what, why, what does this say about the Lord? Um, what has become so, what are our eyes so blind to that we just can't see it anymore? Um, sometimes we just lack imagination. Um, we don't have the kind of imagination that the Lord wants us to have because he is doing things. He's taking history somewhere. Let's read, um, just to finish it up, 2, 1 through 5. Um, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into printing hooks. They wouldn't need them anymore. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Um, invite us to imagine what it looks like to live um, in God's world. Uh, prophecy helps us glimpse that and have a better, better vision, just like we're in the season of Advent right now, where we remember the fulfillment of God's promises, the ones that have already come true, but there is a real longing for the things in our world that are not right. And the brokenness and sadness in your life and in mine and in our world and in the news, the things that should not be. God is coming to undo those things forever. And prophecy is a way that he transforms our heart and our mind to long for that rightly and to live in accordance with that. Okay, let's pray. I've talked enough. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray that you would... um, Help us to be um, better, better readers, good stewards. Um, shape our hearts that we would be faithful to you, that we would love you um, more fully, and that we would trust you. Father, I pray that you would be with these groups as they go out. Help them to talk about the things that you want them to see and, uh, and learn. And I pray that you would have them encourage each other. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.